So this is it. <laughs> so hi, uh, my name is Alex Lebrun, um, and I'm here to speak about uh, natural language for devices, and in, in particular, uh, speech interface on devices. Um, so I'm the founder of a company called Wit.ai, and we do a Siri as a service uh, for developers. So it's a developer platform that makes it very easy to create uh, devices or applications that you can talk to. Uh, so we turn speech into uh, actionable uh, data. Uh, before that, I spent uh, a lot of time uh, building intelligent uh, virtual agents for customer care. Um, so this kind of virtual assistants were used uh, by AT&T or eBay, for instance, to manage almost one billion uh, converse automatic conversations per year. Uh, and we learned many, many things uh, building that. This company was acquired by Nuance Communications uh, last year. So we learned many things. For instance, that as soon as people understand they are talking to a robot and not a human, 10% uh, start to sexually harass the, the, the robot, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and then, more surprising, if it's a boy, a boy virtual avatar, it, sexual harassment is the same. It's not diminished by the fact it's a boy or a girl. And, ma and many, many other things are across these uh, conversations. Um, so human fascination for talking machines is not new. It's very, very old. Already in, in the Greek mythology, you find talking robots, talking machines. And um, it became central in computer science when Alan Turing in the 50s tried to define what a thinking machine and he defined it in terms of a thinking machine is a machine that you can, a human can talk to and not realize that it's a machine and not a human. Uh, so it's a subject that's very hot for, that has been very hot for computer scientists for, for a long time. Um, as early as 62, the very first, uh, what we call the chatterbot, so like this automatic chat uh, machine, uh, was released by the MIT. So it, it was m more or less a game or it was not serious, but Hollywood loved it and after that, you found uh, AIs, talking AIs in many, many movies. Uh, one of them, of course, in uh, a Space Odyssey, the HAL. Uh, very, very smart uh, AI. Um, you also had cars. This is a kit in the 80s, um, which is a kind of a Google self-driving car with Google, Pl Google Plus, Google uh, uh, Now. Every, you know, maybe I, I wonder if Sergey Brin is not tr just trying to build this with Google Now. Um, so it, it, it was also a very, very smart car. Um, unfortunately, the reality is, is very, very far from there. And, and 30 years later, we are still very far from these um, Hollywood examples. So I just got something on YouTube um, that shows the experience you might experience yourself with your car. Media. <laughs> anyway, the audio is enough, you know, I'm talking about speech. It's okay if there is no image. Media. Media. Night. Hey, girl, so media. Media. Night. Playlist. TV. <laughs> so you get, you can, you can uh, think back. I'm not going to turn on my TV. I'm going to play music. Music. You can operate many functions of the MMI quickly and easily with the speech dialogue system. So I, I, I won't show you everything, but you can find hundreds of videos like that on YouTube. You know, I, don't, I, I never met anybody that was happy with his, his car uh, voice uh, systems. Um, so in the real world, today, you find speech uh, deployed mostly in high-end cars, like, like the one we've seen. Um, and I'm, again, I don't think it's a, it's a good experience. Um, you find it in IVR, so automatic call centers, and I'm sure everybody uh, hates when you find <laughs> a machine uh, that doesn't understand anything about what you say, and speaking with my French accent, uh, it's still worse. Um, and more recently, a speech um, made an appearance on smartphones starting with Siri three years ago. 
Um, and it, it's more interesting, but just about 10% of iPhone users really use Siri on, on a regular basis. Uh, and among them, um, most of them use just three or four commands with Siri. So they, they, they use, for instance, set an alarm and, and directions and nothing else. So it's not a, success for, uh, a successful implementation. Uh, so, so the, and yet, voice commands will become very, very important because devices uh, get, get smaller and smaller and smaller and traditional uh, means of input like, like touch just won't work anymore with wearables, with smart devices um, that are coming now. Um, so th there, were, there will be many, many devices that we control with voice uh, very, very soon. So w why is this very difficult to build a speech uh, interface? First, you have two categories of users. Some of them have tried it, like the guy in the, in the video, and they say, I will never ever again use a, use a speech uh, interface. And some other people have never tried it, and they have very too, too high expectations. So if I ask my mother, this is a speaking uh, machine, you can ask whatever you want. She, she will ask crazy questions about philosophy and history, and of course, there's no way we can do this as of today. So it's very hard because nobody almost is in between these, key, these two extremes uh, categories of users. Then, technically, it's still a very, very hard artificial intelligence problem. You have many things to do. You have to turn speech into text and understand the text, decide about the action you want to take, generate a response, build speech again. And if any of these uh, steps fails, then you have a failure. And, and, and more difficult, you have to do all that in less than one second. One second is the absolute maximum latency that you can afford above one second users won't be happy because it's too slow. And users will accept one or two failure, but it has to be quick failure. Th wh what they really hate is waiting five seconds and then getting a random answer. Th this is really, and then they will never use the system uh, again. And the third reason why it's difficult is all the, the objects we use have a, a, a graphical user interface which communicates how to use, w what they can do, and how to use them. So, if you see a hammer, you, you know that you, you cannot drill a hole with this hammer. There is a handle, and, and you guess how to use it. Um, computer, computer systems also, uh, you see icons, you see menu, you see buttons. So you, you see for very quickly what you can do with this interface. And even humans, if I look at her, I know she can make coffee for me, but I won't ask about philosophy. Oh, I, I might try, but uh, so we communicate functions, so this is my function. But we, when you look at that, what, what, is, what is the function of that? What is the scope? What, what can it do? What, what, what cannot it do? So it's really hard when you build speech system on, on, on devices like that. So what's new uh, today? Uh, first, th there was a major breakthrough in speech recognition uh, two or three years ago owing to uh, Microsoft and Google. So using deep neural networks, but also more data and more processing power, the, the word error rate, which was almost the same for 10 years, uh, suddenly dropped about 10 points, and we are speech recognition starts to really work well uh, today. Um, the other thing is smart devices. If you look at the Nest, for instance, you, you understand the function of this device. So the problem of you have a device and uh, you have a speech interface and you don't know what you can do with it is resolved because you, you, you guess that this is about temperature, thermostat, and it defines the scope of the, this device. And the third point is there is a new approach with using API and a community to have developers help each other to solve this problem rather than, you know, before that you, you could either get a PhD and use Academia or pay $5 million, $5 million to Nuance Communications and they will build it for you. So there is a new approach among developers to this problem. Um, to, to, to I just will talk about a few best practices. Um, if you want to, to, if you consider building a speech interface for your project, for your device, or your app, uh, the first question is, what is the scope? What is the set of commands I want to, my app to recognize? Um, and depending on the noise you have, the type of microphone, the distance from the user to the microphone, this set of commands may be too, um, too big uh, or reasonable. So um, you can make very simple commands with a lot of noise, or you can make more complex commands, a bigger scope, 
if you have a very good audio quality. So there, there is something to, you, have, you have to ask and, and, and find out if it's possible or not. Also, you have the question of, do you, want a, uh, I, do you agree with the cloud processing where you have much more power, but you need an internet connection? Or, um, or do you want embedded processing, which is still uh, very, very hard to do. So today, it will work only with very, very simple commands. So if your device is not connected, you cannot expect too much from a speech interface. So this is an example of an Arduino and Raspberry Pi based uh, home automation system that somebody built. It's just capturing audio, streaming it to the WID API, and getting the which light uh, to, to turn on and off in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the home. Uh, so it's a very simple scope, and it works well, even if it's a very lightweight uh, device. Uh, second practice is, as we saw, you have to set the user expectations about what you can do. And so your device might communicate that because of the shape of, 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 or something else in the device. But if it doesn't communicate, you have to find other way to tell your user before they start using it, is it using it, here is a set of commands, I can, what I can do. Um, so for instance, uh, this is a barista robot, uh, and it, it, it really works, I, I tried it. So you can ask for latte, soy wet latte with uh, cream and, and caramel, uh, and you'll get it. So you understand when you look at this robot uh, that it can do coffee, but nothing else. So you can ask very complex orders, uh, it will work well. Um, third, um, you, you shouldn't ask your users to adapt to you. You should adapt to the users. And so, for instance, this was a Pine Pilot, uh, if you remember, um, help to, and they tell you, okay, forget about uh, what you, 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 you've learned at school. This is a way you should, you should write. And this is really wrong. You shouldn't train your user to say radio instead of I want to listen to radio. Um, this is a re really bad uh, practice. So you have to uh, listen to your users. This is called without of O's. It's a technique where you, the user thinks they have a, a speech interface, and actually you are just recording them and listening to them. And so you discover how they will uh, express themselves in this way. Um, so this is an, a successful project with a null robot. It's a humanoid uh, robot. It's very nice, but it cost uh, about $20,000 today. Um, and, and these guys made a very nice speech, speech interface for this lab. And they, they started from nothing and just learned what people want to tell the, the robot and made a, a very nice project. And, and finally, um, actually, the, the best speech interface sometimes is no speech interface. So if you can be proactive and guess what the user wants to do before he even knows and has to ask, this is better than the best of speech interface. Um, so, so for instance, this is a running assistant applications for, for iPhone. So if you want to, to, to run in the forest, you can, it can help you. Uh, if, it's, it will, if it starts raining, if, if it's about to start to rain, this assistant will tell you, oh, it's going to rain in five minutes. It, it, it doesn't wait for you to ask about the weather. Uh, it will just push this information. And then you can say if you want to go back home or continue running, and it will handle the situation. So be, being proactive, uh, I think, for any device is, is still the best uh, uh, experience for, for the user. Uh, so we are st still very, very far from uh, this. I don't know if you've seen Her, the movie Her. Uh, but actually, we are uh, step by step, step uh, building this. And uh, uh, if you are considering building a speech interface, I, I recommend you, s you look at this movie. Uh, it's a very, very interesting user experience that they describe uh, along the movie. So um, thanks. And um, I, I will also use this opportunity to say that we are hiring software engineers. And as you can uh, guess from my French accent, we are based in Palo Alto, California. <laughs> and uh, so if you <laughs> don't hesitate to shoot me an email if you are interested. Thank you. Yeah, so um, after spending uh, 12 years uh, building speech interface on demand for big enterprise for typically $200,000 or, so, or more, um, we, we saw more and more uh, need on the market coming from very small 
companies or even individual projects, side projects, and uh, more and more people need a speech interface. So we decided to, uh, after we sold the company to Nuance, um, we, we, we decided to try to provide this same uh, capability to developers uh, through uh, a, a platform that, that, that can use uh, easily without any professional service and, and so virtually for free. So who, who's an ideal uh, partner or user of this? What kind of app, what kind of connected device? Uh, so, any, so, so for instance, Peb, we are working with uh, Pebble, uh, Watchmaker. Actually, we work off their offices in Palo Alto. Um, so these kind of devices where you can imagine how, what kind of experience you could build with voice is a very good uh, candidate. Home automation uh, devices uh, are nice and we have SDKs for I uh, iOS, Android, so not all apps are good candidates for speech uh, commands, but s some of them are, especially if the user is driving or running or do doing something or cooking with uh, dirty hands uh, and so on. Yeah, uh, especially for um, uh, glassware, so Google Glass. Many people are starting to build uh, B2B apps for Google Glass in the health industry, uh, also in retail, in sup supply chain. And it's a very good tool um, because when you wear this, uh, this glassware, you don't want to, to swipe or to type something on the keyboard. Um, so the question is, um, I mentioned word error rate as, as a big obstacle that was uh, almost solved. And what are the next uh, obstacles that we have to solve now? Um, I think we, we are almost there. Uh, a big obstacle is the, is the quality of audio. Uh, if the, the, the user is, is far away from the device and there is a lot of uh, background noise, noise, like in the street or when you drive, it's still very, very, it's still hard to, to capture uh, the meaning of what the user wants to do um, because of the noise. Uh, so it's, um, and th this is why only applications with a very uh, small scope, a small set of commands, uh, will work in this kind of environment. So for instance, if I tell my, pe my Pebble, uh, make, me up, make me up tomorrow at six, it will understand, even if it understands make me up, it will still capture that I, I want to set an alarm. And I, I actually, I was saying, wake me up tomorrow, because the set of commands is, is very small. Great. So that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Thank you.